All right. So, you know, you're reading about potential threats and then bam, the U.S. reveals its answer. Right. The F-47 fighter jet. Yeah. This thing has apparently been in development to counter China's new aircraft. And the goal is very clear. Oh, yeah. Keeping the U.S. at the top in the skies. Absolutely. It, it, a development like this doesn't just appear out of thin air. Right. It's a result of you know, strategic thinking, technological leaps. And really importantly for our discussion today, a careful look back at what we've learned. Mm. The story of the F-47 is really tied to the lessons learned from the F-35. Exactly. And that's where this deep dog is going today. Okay. We're not just going to be admiring the shiny new jet. Right. We want to get under the hood of the F-47. And to do that, we need to talk about the F-35. Okay. The F-35 was a groundbreaking program, mm -hmm. but it also taught us a lot about procurement challenges. Absolutely. So our goal today is to figure out what happened with the F-35. <laughs> Unpack the acquisition malpractice and the intellectual property issues and see see how those lessons are shaping the development of the F-47. That sounds good. We've got some really interesting stuff to look at today. Great. Including expert analysis of the F-47. Okay. As well as some pretty direct criticisms of how the F-35 program went down. Interesting. This is really your shortcut to understanding a major shift in military tech and how the Pentagon is buying weapons. Let's start with the F-35. Okay. It was meant to be this paradigm-shifting fifth-generation fighter, and in many ways it was. Mm. But it also became a cautionary tale about how complex and risky these huge defense programs can be. Right. A key part of this was concurrency. Concurrency. Yeah. It sounds like a business school term. It does. What did that mean when they were actually building these jets? Well, they basically decided to start building the F-35. Okay. While they were still finalizing the design. Really? Yeah. So they were making the planes and still figuring out all the engineering details at the same time. Oh. Like if you can imagine trying to mass produce a new iPhone before all the software bugs are worked out. Oh, I see. Yeah. So what happened when they started finding problems during testing? Well, what happened was that they ended up having to spend tons of time and money on retrofits and modifications. Wow. Because planes that were already built had to be brought back in to be upgraded with all these design changes. So they're left now. It'd be like yeah. building a car factory mm -hmm. and realizing halfway through you need to redesign the engine. Wow. And all the cars you've already started making. That's so inefficient. Yeah. And we actually have a quote about this, right? Yeah. Someone was pretty direct in their assessment. Absolutely. Back in 2012, Frank Kendall, okay. who was the Air Force's top acquisition official, yeah. he did not hold back. He called the early production of the F-35 acquisition malpractice. Wow. He pointed out that there were nine non-test F-35s already sitting in hangars. Wow. Before they even did the first nighttime test flight. Oh, wow. And that happened in May of 2012. Okay. And incredibly, these early production models had only gone through something like 20% of their planned testing. Only 20%. That's crazy. It is. They're building these super advanced machines without even knowing if they would work. Right? Yeah. It's no wonder they ran into problems. No kidding. Yeah. But it wasn't just about the timing of the production, was it? No, it wasn't. There was also this big question of who owned the technology behind the F-35. Right. The issue of intellectual property is one of the biggest and longest lasting lessons we've learned from the F-35. Okay. Unlike what usually happens, the U.S. government didn't get ownership of the intellectual property for the F-35's design. Okay, so break that down for me. Sure. Why is the government not owning the IP such a big deal? Well, it essentially gave the main contractor, Lockheed Martin, a lot of power. Mm hmm because they own all of the technical data, the blueprints, the software code, all of it. Right. That means they control the whole life of the aircraft, upgrades, maintenance, everything. Wow. Frank Kendall later called this a perpetual monopoly. Perpetual monopoly. Mm. That doesn't sound like it would save money or encourage innovation. You're right. Without owning the technical data, it's almost impossible for the government to get competitive bids for things like maintenance. Right. Basically, only the company that owns the IP can actually fix and modify the aircraft. Yeah. And this limits competition. Right. Because there's not much incentive for the contractor to make things more cost effective mm -hmm. or come up with better solutions. Yeah. So what was the idea behind this approach in the first place? Why, Why didn't the government just say, we own the IP from the start? The idea at the time was total system performance responsibility. Okay. Basically, they wanted to give the contractor responsibility for the whole thing from start to finish, like including maintenance. Okay. The thought was this would make things simpler and everyone would know who is accountable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but it sounds like that might have had some unintended consequences. Yeah. 
Yeah, some critics think this model might have actually discouraged contractors from making weapons that are simpler to maintain. Oh, how so? The argument is that the contractor makes most of their money over the long term from these really complicated and expensive maintenance contracts. Yeah. So if the jet's too easy to keep running, they're not going to make as much money. Wow. So there could be a conflict of interest built into the system. Yeah, that's the concern. That's a really interesting point. Now, I remember hearing some allies who also fly the F-35 were worried about a kill switch. Oh, right. How does this IP situation relate to that? There's been a lot of talk about that hypothetical kill switch. Right. You know, the idea that the U.S. government could disable any F-35, yeah. including the ones our allies have. Right. The truth is, though, that the U.S. government not owning the data is a different issue from a kill switch. Mm. Control over the data rests with Lockheed Martin because of the IP agreements. So it's not really about the U.S. government having direct control. Right. It's more like they're dependent on the contractor to maintain and upgrade the planes. Yeah, and this lack of ownership by the government has had big financial consequences. Yeah, how so? Well, since the Air Force doesn't own the technical data, right. they're basically stuck with Lockheed Martin when it comes to sustainment contracts. Right. You can see this really clearly with a $6.66 billion dollar sustainment contract that was given to Lockheed in 2021. Wow. Negotiations on that actually stalled last year, oh, wow. which forced the government to use these short-term options just to keep the F-35s flying. And the cost of the entire F-35 program is just huge. Yeah, it really is. They estimate the total cost of buying over 2,400 F-35s to be about $379.4 billion. Wow. But it doesn't stop there. Right. Operating and maintaining them over the next 50 years is estimated to cost a trillion dollars. Trillion dollars. It's a massive financial undertaking. It really is. Huh? So this brings us to the F-47 NGAD, the new fighter jet. Yes. It feels like this is a response not just to China, but also to everything they learned from the F-35. It definitely seems that way. Hmm. They really highlighted the F-47 unveiling on March 21st. Yeah. As a commitment to staying ahead in the air, especially with all these new challenges. And everyone's talking about how they're trying to avoid the problems they had with the F-35. Right. So what are the big differences this time? Well... What are they doing to avoid repeating those mistakes? Yeah. Frank Kendall, yeah. who is now the Secretary of the Air Force, okay. has been very clear about this. Good. He said that the government will own the intellectual property for the F-47. Oh, wow. This is a big change. They also want to use a modular design with open systems okay. so that different suppliers can contribute to developing the plane and making upgrades in the future. So they're trying to avoid that perpetual monopoly. Exactly. And Kendall has also said they'll be keeping a much closer eye on the program. Okay, so this is a big shift in how they're approaching things. Yeah, it is. What about what the F-47 can actually do? Well... Is this just a small upgrade or is this a big jump? It's a huge leap forward. They say it will be more advanced than even the F-22 and the F-35. Really? Yeah, and the plan is for it to eventually replace the F-22. Wow. The unveiling was also a chance for the U.S. to counter China's claims about having the first sixth-generation fighter. Oh, right. They hinted that the F-47 has actually been flying in secret since 2020. So they've been working on this in secret for a while. Yeah, they have. And it's part of that larger next-generation air defense system, or NGAD. Right. It's supposed to work with things like the B-21 Raider bomber. Mm -hmm. General David Alvin, who is the Air Force Chief of Staff, Okay. he said the F-47 will have things like advanced sensor fusion, long-range strike capabilities, and new stealth tech that can counter even the most sophisticated enemies. So who's building this new jet? Mm. Is it still Lockheed? Well, this is interesting. Okay. The contract for the engineering and manufacturing development phase of the F-47 went to Boeing. Oh, wow. It's worth about $20 billion. Okay. And that includes building the first test aircraft. So Boeing's back in the fighter jet game. They are. And the contract also includes options for the initial production at competitive prices, but, which shows they're thinking about costs from the very beginning. Right. And this is a big change from the F-35. Yeah, it is. They're really trying to encourage competition this time. Now, I also read about this idea of Collaborative Combat Aircraft, or CCAs. Yes, the CCAs. What are those, and how do they fit in with the F-47? 
These are basically a new generation of drones okay. that are supposed to work with the F-47. Mm -hmm. It's important to remember, though, that the CCAs were developed and will be bought separately from the F-47. Okay. The main idea is that these drones will be cost effective. Okay. So the F-47 won't have to carry every sensor and weapon itself. Mm -hmm. A CCA could carry a targeting pod, extra missiles, or even jammers for electronic warfare. Oh, I see. So they're taking some of the load off the F-47. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense. And what about cost? Right. That was a big issue with the F-35. It was. What are they expecting the F-47 to cost? The Pentagon definitely wants to control the budget better this time. Yeah. At first, they thought a sixth generation fighter would cost around $300 million each. Okay. But last year, Secretary Kendall said they want to keep the price of the F-47 similar to the F-35. Okay. Which is about $100 million per variant. Hmm. General Alvin even thinks the F-47 will end up costing less than the F-22, which is about $143 million. So they're really trying to manage the costs from the start. Yeah, they are. Learning from the F-35. Exactly. The Air Force wants $2.7 billion in the 2025 budget for the F-47. Okay. And they're planning to spend $19.6 billion over the next five years. It really seems like what they learned from the F-35, both good and bad, is shaping how they're developing the F-47. Absolutely. The experience with the F-35, especially the issues with concurrent development and IP rights, mm -hmm. have completely changed how they're buying the F-47. Yeah. The goal is clear. Okay. Build a better plane that can dominate the skies, yeah. but without making the same expensive mistakes. So what does all of this mean? It feels like this is a really important time, not just for military jets, but for how the U.S. develops these expensive and complicated weapon systems. It is. With all this money and technology involved, what does it mean for future tech and national security? Yeah. What else besides IP and concurrency will determine if the F-47 is a success? That's a really great question. Definitely something to think about. Yeah. All right. That's it for our deep dive today. Great talking to you. You too.